So far in this class, we've seen how to do harmonic oscillators using Lagrangian mechanics. And now to continue on that work, we're going to see how to treat harmonic oscillators that are damped um, by some damping force using Lagrangian mechanics. So I'm going to look at the damped harmonic oscillator. And so for example, this could be a spring, mass m, and spring constant k. But maybe the spring is underwater. And so there's going to be some force acting on the on the mass besides the spring that's going to dampen that motion. And so, for example, a common assumption that's made with damping forces is that they depend on the velocity of the motion and that they are linear in that dependence. So x dot for the velocity, and then this b term is some constant. And of course, if b is the larger that b gets, the more damped the oscillations will be. Okay, so if that's our damping force, how do we incorporate that into our Lagrangian? So We'll remember that our Lagrangian is T minus V. And so for a simple harmonic oscillator, that was one half MX dot squared minus K, uh, one half KX squared. Now you could be thinking, well, we have a force negative b x dot. Can we change that force into an energy using the work energy theorem? Uh, but unfortunately, this, we can't really do this integral. So, we can't insert our um, damping force into our Lagrangian by turning it into an energy. So what can we do? Well, we will continue using the Lagrangian and set up our Euler-Lagrange equations like we have before. So Take your derivatives with respect to x and x dot. Take the time derivative of the partial with respect to x dot. So all stuff that we've seen before. And so now in a regular Euler-Lagrange equation, you would have that the time derivative of the partial with respect to x dot minus the partial derivative with respect to x equals zero. So this is your typical Euler-Lagrange equation. But remember, we have this extra force term that we're trying to add in there as well. So for forces that depend linearly on velocity, uh, 
like for example, our course that we wrote down earlier, we can modify our Lagrange, our Euler-Lagrange equation. And so you might notice, so in your Euler-Lagrange equation, this dl by dx dot dt minus dl by dx. So this was mx double dot minus uh, kx. You'll notice, so mx double dot is just ma, so that has units of force. kx is the spring force, Hooke's law, so that has units of force. And so on this right hand side in if we're only looking in one dimension and our force is only in one dimension, then we can just write the damping force here. And so that damping force was negative B X dot. Okay, so that's the final answer, but to see where this is coming from, other than just looking at the units and saying, well, they both have units of force, so maybe that works. Um, so instead of doing that, we are going to um, show where this is coming from. And where this is coming from is coming from the Rayleigh dissipation equation or formula, maybe I'll call it formula. And so this comes directly from the problem that we're addressing in that people have been using or saw that they could use the Lagrangian to get equations of motion, but forces that depend on the velocity don't fit into the Lagrangian. So how do you deal with those? And so the general form of the uh, dissipation formula looks like this. So the negative velocity so this is not the velocity gradient, that's a different thing. But if you rewrite your gradient and do partial derivatives with respect to velocity instead of partial derivatives with respect to position, that's what this, is, this means. So if you take the gradient and do velocity derivatives instead on this cursive R, which is the Rayleigh function, function, then that will equal your dissipative force. And so let me just write down, so this is the partial derivative with respect to x dot plus the partial derivative with respect to y dot plus the partial derivative with respect to x dot on some function r equals your dissipative force. So like I said, in our one dimensional case, our dissipative force or our damping force was negative b x dot. So in the one dimensional case, we're only doing partial derivative with respect to x dot on the Rayleigh function 
equals negative b x dot. So we can find the Rayleigh function by taking the, so let's move, let's, let's take the, so if you take the integral with respect to x dot on both sides, Now the, the integral of dx dot d by dx dot just goes to one. So you get the negative Rayleigh function equals, and now the derivative of, or the integral of x dot with respect to x dot is just x dot squared over two. And so our Rayleigh function is b x dot squared over two. Now we found our Rayleigh function. Now, how do we add that into our Lagrangian? So the, the Lagrangian or the Euler Lagrange with the Rayleigh function added in is, so you take your regular Euler-Lagrange and then that equals the negative partial derivative of the Rayleigh function with respect to x. So again, this is all looking in one dimension. I'll show you multi-dimensional in a second and show you why you can't just always plug the force in. Uh, but for our 1D example, then this just comes out to mx double dot minus kx equals b. So the negative of that negative b x dot. So this is the same thing that we had before. And then I'll put a caveat here that this is only 1d or And so what I, what I mean by linearly independent force is, for example, we had this really easy force, negative b x dot. And if things are simple, you could expand this to be y dot, z dot, so three-dimensional. And then if you took your if you wanted to find the, the Rayleigh function of this, you would integrate with respect to x dot y dot and z dot. It's not added. Oops. 
and this would be a triple integral because it's sort of the three dimensions. Um, and you would get your Rayleigh function is b over two x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. And then of course, the instead of doing the partial of r, you're doing the negative gradient of r to get the Uh, the terms that go into your Lagrangian. Oops. And so, for example, the, if we do, maybe I'll do the y direction since we did the x in one dimension already. Now, everything's going to look pretty much the same which is what we want. And if this was a harmonic oscillator in three dimensions, then maybe it would look like, um, Okay, so same, same thing that we had in one dimension. Um, so nothing new there, but where things would get interesting is if these x, y, and z velocities are not in the linearly independent. And so this equation looks similar and is still fairly simple because these are linearly independent. If instead your force is something, and let's just go in two dimensions, maybe x dot, y dot. Oops. And maybe let's say it's X dot y dot in the i hat direction plus two x dot y dot in the j hat direction. Now, if you wanted to do your negative velocity gradient with respect to g, that's f. So then your f is this thing now your integral that you have to do to get g so it would be a double integral with respect to dx dot dy dot. But now you can see that you're, you're gonna have cross terms. So this integral would look something like negative um, x dot squared y dot. And then plot a two plus two y dot squared x dot. Oh, I guess there's even more terms than I was thinking. Okay, plus dx dot. Plus two x dot or just all right, let's not pull out this over two. So this 
x dot x dot squared y dot plus now there's the y derivatives so you would get x dot y dot squared over 2 plus x dot y dot squared so that's negative 3b over 2 x dot squared y dot plus y dot squared x dot and so now you've got these cross terms because the motion in the x direction or the dissipative force in the x direction depends on your velocity in the y direction and your velocity in the y or the dissipative force in the y direction depends on your velocity in the x direction now if you wanted to write down your Euler-Lagrange equation in the y direction. So again, the left-hand side will still be the same. But now your, why did I write? All of these g's should have been r's because that's what we've been using for our Rayleigh equation. Yeah, don't know why I switched to g's for a second. Okay, so now the, so this is still my double dot minus the partial derivative of ky equals. So now the partial derivative of this with respect to y dot is negative 3b over 2 x dot squared plus 2 y dot x dot. Okay, so this, this would be your um, second order differential equation that you'd have to solve. And of course it's coupled because there's X and Y dot terms in here. So you'd have a similar one um, in the X direction. Um, it would probably be y dots, yeah, y dot squared plus two x dot y dot. And so you would have to use some kind of uh, mathematical techniques that are beyond this class to solve this coupled second order differential equation. Uh, but if it, if it couldn't be done, um, Analytically, it could certainly be solved numerically, uh, meaning you just plug numbers into the equation and figure out what the solution is for those specific numbers. But anyways, what I want, the whole reason for doing this exercise was showing that the, the dampening force that we had assumed uh, back here, which was negative B, x dot y dot in the i hat plus two x dot y dot in the j hat. So that's not the term that is going into the right hand side of this equation. So when I said very early on that you could just plug in the dampening force here, that really only applied because we were doing stuff in one dimension and or uh, because our force was linearly independent in that direction. So you could kind of see in the 2D example that we did where um, as long as your, uh, even if you went to higher dimensions, as long as your uh, force was 
independent along, like if the force in the x direction only depended on the x velocity and the force in the y direction only depended on the y velocity, then everything would work out pretty much the same. But then when we had this more complicated example where uh, force in the y depended on velocity in the x, um, you get a much more complicated example where you can't just directly plug the force in to the right-hand side of your modified Euler-Lagrange equation. So this is maybe more complicated than anything we'll see in this class, but uh, so something like this is what you would need for this class. Uh, just realizing that you can plug in the dampening force on the right-hand side. But I wanted to explain this caveat that if you go on to something more complicated, you can't just plug in the dampening force. So, okay, so all that to explain how we insert a dampening force into our Euler Lagrange equation. And so now that we've done that, let's go back to the, the 1D example. And so our modified Euler-Lagrange equation looked like this. Um, M x double dot minus k x equals negative b x dot. And so if we moved everything onto the same side of the equation, we would have a second order differential equation, which we could solve using the method where we set, uh, pretend that like x dot, uh, x double dot goes to y squared, x dot goes to y and x to the no t derivative just goes to one, then this equation would look like, uh, and then before we started solving it, we would wanna isolate the, the second derivative term. So this would look like this, b over m x dot minus k over m x, And then our polynomial equation that we'd want to solve would look like this. N, y minus k n equals zero. And so you could solve this using um, your quadratic formula, B over M, and that would look a bit messy, negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four times a times c all over twice a. And so this is a solution to this polynomial equation. And what that means is that we can solve our linear or not linear, our um, second order differential equation by plugging in these solutions into the general formula. Uh, so x as a function of time 
equals a e to the negative something plus b e to the negative or positive something else times time. And what those some things are, are these two solutions. And so on the next slide, I'll write a more general solution. And I'm gonna make writing this a little easier by using two new variables, beta and omega naught. I guess this should still be negative. And then the way that these two things are different is that there's a minus sign up here. And then there's a time in both of those exponents. Okay. And so the reason, so if I rewrite things with these betas and omega naughts, it's just a little bit easier to write. And this beta term is defined as the um, Uh, so using our, so if we look back at our equation, uh, this was negative b over m over two. And so that's just b over two m. And then the omega naught term is or maybe omega naught squared is the familiar k over m. So omega naught is square root k over m. And so this is your angular frequency if there were no uh, dampening. So this could be called the natural frequency of the of the spring. And this beta, of course, is your dampening term. And then we remember that we can rewrite our exponents to be uh, cosines. Maybe I'll use this constant C since I already used A and B, E to the minus beta T cosine of omega one minus oh, omega one T. And then there is this plus delta term uh, when you do this, but uh, I don't, I don't, this is just a phase shift. So it's, it's not very important. So whenever I write the solution, I just ignore it. Because it's one less thing to write. And so now I've introduced another new term, this omega one term. And that's just the square root of beta or omega squared minus beta squared. And so now there's a couple things to note. So you can you can use either this these two exponentials or this exponential and cosine term. And uh, we'll see the consequences of those two things in a second. But before we do that, I want to show
So we're stating that this is the solution for the equation of motion for this damped oscillator. Uh, but let's check that this is by taking the derivatives of that function and seeing if they satisfy the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation that we have here. So let's make sure that, and we'll rewrite this to be x double dot minus, I guess, plus, this should be plus k over m. All right, let's do the x dot term, b over m x dot plus k over m x equals zero. So now we've stated that this is the equation for the equation of motion for our mass uh, that is a damped harmonic oscillator. Uh, but let's check that that's the case uh, against this equation. So we'll take time derivatives of this function x of t and see if it satisfies that equation. So the first derivative x dot is two beta times, or sorry, in a second. So just the time derivatives are negative c e to the minus beta t. And then you've got the beta times cosine of omega t that's coming from taking the derivative of this exponent and then plus omega one sine of omega one t. And that's from taking the derivative of the cosine term. Okay, now x double dot will be four terms, but we can Simplify it a bit by writing it like this c e to the beta minus beta t times beta squared minus omega not or omega one squared times cosine of omega one t plus two beta omega one sine of omega one t. And so this is four terms, but we factored it in such a way that we only have these cosine and sine terms, and then we've got this beta squared minus omega one squared term out front. And then of course our x term was just uh, c e to the minus beta t cosine of omega t. Okay, so this is our x, our position, our velocity, and our acceleration in the x direction. And now if we wanted to, we could write it down, we could write down our Euler-Lagrange equation, x double dot plus e over m plus k over m plus zero. And let's rewrite this using omega naught and uh, beta. So that's x double dot plus two beta x dot plus omega naught squared x equals zero. So 
So we're basically multiplying this term by two beta, multiplying this term by omega naught squared. So when we do that, you see that we'll get a two beta times negative C, well, I guess, so first, all of the terms have the C e to the minus beta, so we can just cancel all of those out. Two beta would be distributed to this beta cosine omega one T and this omega one sine omega one T. So you'll see there's also a two beta omega one sine omega one T here. So this one has a negative in it. Maybe I'll do color coded. So the top line has a negative in it. So this would cancel with that. Now we've got a and then maybe we'll I'll rewrite this so that we can start distributing things. So from the two beta x dot term, we have two beta negative squared cosine omega one t. And the x double dot term, we've got this beta squared minus omega one squared cosine omega one t. And from our omega naught x, we've got omega naught cosine of omega one t. So we're pretty close now. So the only thing we have to do is expand this. So omega one we defined as square root of b squared minus, or omega naught squared minus b squared. Minus beta squared. So if we plug that in, we get omega naught squared minus beta squared so this beta squared is negative negative, so it would be plus beta squared. And so this whole thing reduces to two beta squared minus omega naught squared. So this is two beta squared cosine omega one T minus omega naught squared cosine of omega one T. Okay, so now you've got a negative two beta and a positive two beta, so those guys cancel. And then you've got a negative omega naught squared cosine omega one T, a positive one, so those cancel. And so you get zero equals zero. So this X, x double dot plus two beta x dot plus omega naught x was supposed to equal zero and everything canceled out so we do get that zero equals zero so it's important to if you're just given a solution to something like a differential equation it's important to check that that solution is actually correct. And so we've just done that. Okay, so we now agree that this um, function solves the differential equation. And now what does this function tell us. So first, obviously this is some superposition of a, a cosine and a exponential. So you could kind of imagine what that looks like. 
So just generally, you could have, so if this was your, let's, let's draw just a regular cosine in red, cosine of omega t, and then in blue, you've got your regular exponential e to the minus beta t. Then you would expect the superposition of those two to be some kind of oscillating function that starts high and then with every cycle, it gets smaller and smaller. The amplitude gets smaller and smaller. And so that's kind of generally what you would expect. And because of this omega one term that we defined, square root of omega naught squared minus beta squared, uh, there's actually going to be three uh, scenarios for this oscillation. And so I guess a couple things to check before we move on. So if we look at this equation, C e to the minus beta t cosine of omega one t. If we set beta equal to zero, so beta was the dampening term, but there's no dampening, we should get the same equation that we got for just the regular harmonic oscillator. And so let's Let's look at that. So if we plug beta equals zero here, then omega one just becomes omega naught, which is k over n. Maybe I'll just do squared. And so the cosine of omega one would just go to cosine of omega naught, which is square root of k over m, which is what we had for um, the simple harmonic oscillator. And then, so cosine of omega one t goes to cosine of omega naught t. And then e to the minus beta, so if you plug e to the zero in, you just get one. And so at beta equals zero, x as a function of time, it's just c cosine of omega naught t, which is exactly the same as the simple harmonic oscillator. Which is good. So it's always good to do these kind of sanity checks. Now, uh, going back to our omega one. So that was one case of beta is zero, uh, then there is no dampening, but that's not really interesting for what we're, we're talking about here. So for damped oscillations, there's three types of dampening and they're all related to this relationship between omega naught squared and beta squared. So if these two things are equal, then this is called critically damped. If the 
So then there's two other options, right? So if the dampening is larger than the natural frequency, this would be overdamped. And if the dampening is less than the natural frequency, then this would be underdamped. And so I'll draw what those look like. So for the Uh, let's do so for critically damped, critically damped. Which was omega equals beta. You get so you start off as a cosine. And then the exponential takes over. Then for a an underdamped, you get the the graph that I drew earlier, where you start off with your cosine. That's start off with your cosine, but then with each oscillation, you, your amplitude decreases. And then for something that's overdamped, Uh, you don't really get any oscillations at all. And so maybe, so the overdamped and the un, and the critically damped look pretty similar. So I'm gonna draw them on the same one in different colors. Okay, so critically damped is that overdamped and red. Or omega is less than beta. So this one, they look pretty similar, but the, the overdamped one kind of goes down much faster. So for the critically damped one, it looks like maybe there's still some of that cosine shape, but for the overdamped, it almost just immediately turns into an exponential decay. And so for this underdamped case, uh, there's interesting things you can do. Um, like you can figure out what the and so now you've seen the solution for the simple harmonic oscillator that's damped. And next class, we'll talk about a driven harmonic oscillator. So now you've seen the damped harmonic oscillator and how we treat that using Lagrangian mechanics. Uh, you've seen the solution for the equation of motion and you've seen now the three types of damping, underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped.
This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.